Hi everybody, my name is uh, Michael Jensen. I work at a company called ShareThrough. We're just a few blocks away in the financial district. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you about how we use Finagle. Uh, first, let's start with who is ShareThrough. So we are a native ad company um, founded probably about five years ago. Uh, and recently, we've started working on these uh, mobile ad products. This is all mobile web. It's not uh, native, like iOS native. Uh, it's native like native to the form and function of a publisher's website. Um, the focus of the company is branded content rather than ads. Um, and the ad server itself, which is what I'm going to talk about today, uh, is backed by a second price auction and a self-serve platform, all that good stuff. Um, <clears throat> so we actually use a lot of Twitter projects. We probably could have given a talk about how we use Scalding as well, but um, it wasn't to be. Uh, this is my humble suggestion for a, a logo for Algebird, because there isn't one. Um, <laughs> But uh, it's just a hummingbird skeleton. It's not very creative. Um, so we also use Bootstrap for every website we make. And uh, we were inspired by Summingbird when we worked on our real-time MapReduce um, flow. Um, but yes, yeah, so that's today we're talking about Finagle. So our ad server is slightly different to uh, a regular ad server in that we're not serving uh, a flash object or a single image or anything like that into an iframe. We're actually rendering um, reasonably rich uh, ads with a title and description, a thumbnail. Sometimes they have videos, sometimes they don't. Sometimes it's a Pinterest embed or a picture from Instagram, something like that. Um, and the idea is that each publisher's website is uh, able to reformat the ad to better suit their style. So if you visit PerezHilton.com, you'll get one layout style. Uh, if you visit uh, People.com, you'll get a different layout. Uh, and the idea of that is that we're serving metadata to those placements, um, which makes our ad server slightly nuanced. And it was kind of the reason that we needed to build our own rather than use something like DFP that already exists. So we got started with all this um, just over a year ago now. Um, we sort of came into this space saying, like, well, we have our, we have our desktop system, which is using an off-the-shelf ad server. Um, but is there even a market for us to move into the mobile space? Like, will people buy ads through our system? Can we get publishers to pay us or to run our ads for us. Uh, and the company is very, very big into the, the lean startup methodology. So we do this build, measure, learn cycle with every new product uh, that we work on. So the idea was, let's build the most basic, simple system we can, see if we can get some users in. We won't worry too much about scale until we hit that problem. So in the beginning, we had a uh, Rails app, as everyone does, um, and a Postgres database. Uh, then we needed an actual ad serving system and instead of falling uh, to the same mistakes that everyone makes and building everything into one app, we decided we'd split it up and put a Sinatra app for the um, serving of ads and then everything could nicely be hosted on Heroku and everyone was happy. We didn't have to worry about running ops or scaling servers or deploying things or anything like that. Unfortunately, um, we had some issues with Sinatra. First of all, we were sharing a database with the Rails app, which is kind of like the first commandment broken uh, when building a service-oriented architecture. Um, we weren't sharing it in terms of like reading and writing. Uh, it was more of like, this is the API. You put things in a table, and then I'll read them out. Um, it worked pretty well for a while. The, the issue came when you have the one schema, um, and you need to do filtering and targeting and all that kind of uh, ad server specific stuff. And you get really disgusting queries like this, which is about five or six chained uh, where clauses. And some of them have subselects. Um, that was really bad. This is the worst query that we got to. Um, I actually went back. There was a commit here, and then no traffic after this, because we moved to the new ad server that didn't touch this anymore. And then the next commit was deleting all the stuff. Um, and then the other thing was that new features are difficult to implement. At this point, we had a round robin ad server. So you request an ad, and you get one at random. Uh, but what we really needed was an auction, which is you know, the highest paying advertisers will get run first and then so on down the line. So we went back to the drawing board. Uh, the MVP, we considered that a success. Um, we, we were gaining traction, getting a lot of traffic. Um, and the request for the auction was to help um, satisfy increasing demand when we didn't have as much publisher supply. So if you have more requests than you have inventory, then you need to figure out some way to prioritize. And the auction was a solution to that. The drawing board actually looked like this. The shuffleboard table was kind of the discussion board. Um, <clears throat> the drawing board actually looked like this. And this was kind of inspired by an open house session that we, it was actually in this building um, very soon after Twitter moved here. Um, and the slide that was shown looked much more like this, where you have a content database providing ads, um, an ad selection and filtering, which is a recommendation problem. 
then an optimization biasing system, which is to do with ad performance and optimization, um, converting the bid that the advertiser has put in into a, an auction weight or an auction um, utility. Uh, and then the auction itself is kind of a pricing engine. It takes that information and determines who wins and how much they pay and all that kind of stuff. So we had, we had this built now. Um, we built it uh, to be as simple as possible, hopefully. Uh, and we needed to take it and wrap it in some kind of an HTTP server piece. Um, <clears throat> so we had a pretty free choice of language. Um, the actual um, auction algorithm is reasonably straightforward. Um, just sort of like have a list of things and price them all and pick the top price. Um, so we could choose really like whatever we wanted. Um, we knew we probably wanted something on the JVM because we knew it was going to need to scale. Um, so we looked at JRuby, Sinatra, Play, Akka, Erlang, Finagle. Uh, obviously, we ended up settling on Finagle, uh, and hopefully I will be able to tell you the reasons shortly. Um, the, biggest, the big key, really, for the company and the team was to stay lean. We only had three or four engineers working on the whole system. Um, and a lot of the approaches that we had seemed to like, get really complex really fast. Um, this is my sketch of how an ACA system might look. Um, I'm not an expert in how to build ACTA systems, but I was like getting to this thing where it's like, well, the request needs to go back to a client at some point, so you need to like spin up an auction ACTA for each request and then throw it away, or have some kind of RPC going through the ACTAs or something like that. Um, so we, we stepped away from ACTAs pretty quickly and uh, stepped back to something a little more RPC like, like Finagle. So our new finagled ad server system looks like this. Um, we added an internal API, which was originally exactly Redis's API, but um, we made it a nice RESTful one uh, reasonably recently. Um, the auction logic talks to Redis to determine what ads are available and what to serve. And then Finagle sits in front of that and serves HTTP requests. So we don't use uh, all the features of Finagle that Moses mentioned. Um, we only use the HTTP in and out. Um, and our clients are actually uh, users on the internet. Um, <clears throat> we really love the filters and services. It makes it so easy to compose a stack to, uh, to serve, um, and then also to reason about where logic should go. So as a request comes in, we handle exceptions, which is just a wrapper around that, which will catch a Scala exception um, and map it into a 500 or 400 um, response code, uh, HTTP response, that is. Uh, we filter out favicon requests because browsers insist on asking for favicons. Uh, we filter out heartbeats from our load balancer, which just check whether the server is up or not. Um, then we map the HTTP request into an impression object, which is just a domain object that uh, allows us to run the auction with a little more information, like the geocode, the user's uh, like unique cookie ID, that kind of stuff. Uh, and then we pass it into this auction service, which just does the integration with the logic, um, which is coming from another jar. So this makes each filter really simple. And if somebody came to me tomorrow and said, oh, hey, the heartbeat needs to be also a status update where the load balancer tells you you're in or out or whatever, um, I would know where to put that. And I would be able to put it in either inside the filter heartbeat uh, filter or as another piece in that stack somewhere. Um, that makes it really easy to reason about and sort of expand or debug or whatever. So I'm going to talk through a few wins and fails that we had uh, when integrating Finagle. Uh, things that we really like are the Ostrich integration. So Finagle and Ostrich work together really well, as Moses mentioned. Um, and we get a lot of stats basically exactly for free. Um, so Finagle, the app, reports to an Ostrich stat receiver, which is configured here and in um, another sort of configuration.scala file. Um, and it, it gives us every stat you would ever want about the service that's coming through the server. So response times uh, in any percentile, like 50 to 99, uh, as well as memory usage and other things. We also aggregate um, box level statistics into the same graphite, which means we can take a graphite and a graphite graph, that is, and show latency and memory usage and CPU load all in the same graph at the same time series. And it makes it easy to spot like, oh, request latency went up when the memory went up. Uh, it's pretty neat. Uh, and also heap space that we can see when garbage collects up. Uh, then we use the runtime environment. This is the configuration that I mentioned. So we have um, this auction server config object. Um, these are the only few code pieces that I have. Um, <clears throat> they get, uh, get, we configure the actual ad server configuration and the graphite details. So 
I remove them just for brevity, but the graphite config is like the server address is whatever, and the host the port name port number is whatever, and the prefix production there allows us to um, separate the production and staging and QA and whatever else. Uh, and then the ad server config has just specific configuration for the actual ad server box it's running um, based on its environment. And then to start it all up, we just do this load runtime config and then server.start, and that kicks everything off and gets the, gets the server serving ads. Um, we really love the performance as well. So this is um, a few hours of traffic coming through our system. The bottom lines here, one is for each server. Uh, it's the 50th percentile, which is less than 10 milliseconds and the 99th percentile, which is less than 100 milliseconds and a bit more spiky. <clears throat> um, the reason there's two lines and they're separate is because they're on AWS, um, and one is in the same zone as the Redis instance that stores all the information, and the other is not. So the zone latency is what's uh, separating them there. Uh, and these ad servers serve about 40 million impressions a day. Um, so we're pretty happy with how, um, how well it's scaled up and handled the load. One thing that we uh, struggled with early on, uh, we used Finagle's Redis driver, and there was a bug <laughs> that we had to fight with. Um, basically, we had Rails writing into Redis, um, and when Rails writes an empty key, Redis is fine. But when Finagle tries to read an empty key, its keys and values offset gets messed up. Um, this has apparently been fixed in 6.13, but um, our server is still on 6.2, so we need to upgrade that. Uh, we looked at using other Redis clients, but they were a little tricky to integrate. Um, and so we ended up uh, fixing it on the Rails side, making sure Rails always writes a key. Uh, so that was sort of easy for us to do. But uh, this is sort of the detail about why. So when Redis returns you a, uh, a hash value, you get the keys and values as a sequence. But if one of the values is missing, then Redis would assume that the next key was the value for the first key, and then it would be offset wrong, and then it would get to the end and say, oh, I'm looking for another value now, uh, and then blow up. <clears throat> and the other thing was Finagle's docs. So back in early 2013, Finagle's docs were pretty thin. Um, so a lot of the like, figuring out how to wire everything up was spelunking around in the code. Um, thankfully, there is some pretty good Scala doc, and since it's all backed by Netty, um, objects underneath, we can sort of figure out and infer what happened. Um, but I did have a look at it recently while, while building this slideshow, and it does look much better now, so thank you for that. All right, thanks, thanks very much.